whereas in the last episode, we talked about the hermeneutics of suspicion. Uh, the systemic reading of things beyond the text, which makes us doubt the construction of the consciousness and assume that the author is either deceiving us or self-deceiving. And that there were three masters of this kind of reading, according to Paul Ricoeur and later on Hans-George Gadamer. Um, we also have to pair that with the hermeneutics of faith. Now, the hermeneutics of faith is related to this idea of the heuristic of trust, or you might hear it the heuristic of charity, which is that given a logical statement or any sort of statement, you will try to build up the meaning of the text. You will try to make it work on its own terms, not just by reading your own assumptions into it, as we all do. That's a problem with hermeneutics. We should talk about that's a maybe a hermeneutics to suspicion that we have for ourselves, but by making choices in reading that assumes that an argument or a narrative is essentially trying to be true and that we should make positive meaning of it as best we can within that recursive loop. All right. So a hermeneutic of faith is a hermeneutic that aims to construct the meaning and to trust the author, even when it seems like we shouldn't, so that we should make decisions of charity. Like if something is ambiguous and there are two ways of reading it and one way is weak and the other way is strong, we should actively choose the stronger reading, right? Now, this is also related to rhetorical argumentation tactics, where you steal man in order to defeat the best argument so that your argument is rock solid. But that's not the only thing going on here. So I don't want you to just limit the hermeneutics of faith to that. All right. Now, when Ricoeur and Gadamer were writing about this, um, and I say Ricoeur and Gadamer, a Gadamer and Truth and Method is really kind of going through uh, his understanding of Rancourt. Um The hermeneutics of state is aimed to, quote, restore meaning to the text, to assume the text has meaning, to build the most meaning out of it. It's actually not just a, a, a heuristic of charity, a way of reading that goes to give a strong argument. It's also a way of reading to assume that the text has multiple or maximal transparently understandable meanings. All right. Um, now, obviously, for most of the 20th century, um, in literary studies, the hermeneutics of suspicion have predominated. When you go into like literary theory and critical theory, they operate off the hermeneutics of suspicion from the kinds of sophisticated words we talk about to like trying to find ideology, um, identity biases, uh, privileges, the kinds of things that we kind of consider like basic liberal media criticism today. That's also part of the hermeneutics of suspicion. It's just in some ways, um, the vectors are more in accordance with the suspicions we have today in America at the end of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century. All right. Um, the hermeneutics of faith is different. The scholar Rita Felsky in, in, a, in a paper called Suspicious Minds um, I'm going to link in the show notes for you that was published in Poetics today. Um, goes actually asserts that the hermeneutics of faith became unpopular largely because it wasn't as useful for um, a mode of critique that was very popular in both structural and post structural analysis of literary texts. And given that the people who do literary text criticism became the people who taught. English composition for a long time, and when rhetoric and composition established its own field in the United States, uh, they were often established by 
critical theorist who applied this to broader media, it, it became the dominant way of reading and it's the way that we teach today. The hermeneutics of suspicion dominate. Going back to, if you remember the, the last little mini lecture I gave on this, and these two episodes are going to be short because it's con these concepts are not particularly hard to understand. Um, I told you when I walked into my first like literary critic theory writing about literature class at a small college in Georgia that I got the record thrown at me uh, but historicized very crudely as like a response to the Industrial Revolution and the end of the Romantic Impulse, uh, and then a response to the tragedies of of the mechanization of war in World War One, which is a really an overly simple dynamic. The Franco-Prussian War is pretty fucking brutal, as is the U.S. Civil War. The various wars of unification and and revolution and the Americas are pretty brutal. So to just chalk it up to these like emblematic events as I was given by my professor in an undergrad class at the end of, uh, was it the year 2000 or the year 1999? I can't remember now. Um, you can really see that the herm the hermeneutic of suspicion also kind of plays into a meta narrative Ironically, about the end of meta narratives. All right. Um, so it's something to to look at. Um, so remember that there's a hermeneutic loop, and remember that we're reading recursively, and remember that we're making meaning both word by word, line by line, text by text, corpus by corpus. But we also have to decide, basically, according to God, I'm Marin Ricoeur, if we're going to read to make maximal meaning, to read charitably, or to read uh, to finding various forms of false consciousness, self-deception, etc. And what are what are, what is the the critical lens we're going to do that? All right. Whereas in our reading as a, a the hermeneutics of faith does actually still require a critical lens, but the, the lens is like, how are we going to interpret this argument to make it stronger? How are we going to try to text, take the text on its own accord? What are we going to try to grant the text to make it work? All right. Now, when I teach students to do this today, I actually challenge people to read both ways, to read a text twice once with the hermeneutics of faith to try to build up a meaning of it, and the next with the hermeneutics of suspicion to try to see what maybe you didn't see. You know, so in a way, the hermeneutics of faith is also a way of reading with empathy for the author to try to understand and construct a meaning of the text in a maximal sense before you deconstruct it. All right? This is not just an analytical exercise for textual analysis. This is an analytical exercise for understanding and deconstructing arguments. Right? Some people will, some people, for example, have assumed that I am a fairly orthodox Marxist, while others have assumed that I'm a totally heterodox Marxist because I'll say things like Marx was wrong about X or this text is in contradiction with this text and we have to figure that out or like, how do we privilege this or that text, this published text that had Marx's imperator versus his private letter, which has Marx's uh, private wishes? Which one do we favor? Um, and we haven't even gotten into like picking, you know, favoring text, textual analysis or uh, other heuristics about like logic. But for example, um, Andrew Kleiman's, uh, you know, scientific you know, hermeneutic that he throws out is that if it's, if you can make a text logical and the, and if you can make it read true, you should do that. Um, you should favor the one that makes the text make sense versus the one that doesn't. Now, I think it's ironic to do that to Marx since Marx didn't do that to other people, but it is a good way to make sure you understand Marx, right? My, my, my only question to that is you can actually fill in a whole lot of stuff that's not dare with the hundred of faith to make it work. 
Remember, I'm saying you're reading to make it work and you can impose all sorts of things to do that, which may not have actually been intended or may not be in the text. Which is why you should also take the time to try to look at it critically. Ultimately, the critical reading nor the faithful reading, uh, the hermeneutic of faith or the hermeneutic of suspicion, should ultimately be the only way you approach even a single text structure or truth claim. Right? I do think you have to try to put yourself in the mindset of both ways of thinking at different times and then weigh out which one you think is more useful for you and more likely to be true. And this is, you know, the ultimate question is what does true mean for you when discussing a text? Does it mean the way a text can be used to you today, pragmatically, or in our context? Does it mean trying to get as close to the author's context or the social context which produced the author, um, et cetera, et cetera, and all those two things the same? These are all hermeneutic questions you have to answer. All right. Now, I'm going to put some references in the show notes. These are two brief episodes. I'm going to be building up some longer things in hermeneutics, including the influence on people like Heidegger and going more into Ricoeur. Um, and pointing out in the capstone of the series, why it matters that we are able to get a grasp of reception history. What were the hermeneutics and assumptions that people writing about a text in the secondary and tertiary literature maintained. I'll tell you, this really comes up a lot when like you read people who are not specialists in Marx talk about Karl Marx and you realize they're like, they have a bad reading of Marx, but it was the popular reading in academia at the time. And these are not experts referring to other seeming experts who have their own agendas. And that sets up a hermeneutic school. And that sets up a system of interpretations. And maybe also we interpret the words differently or we interpret it in light of certain events. And if now what I do with other texts on this channel, particularly trying to get you guys to engage in like long durée understandings of particular left-wing text, not and right-wing text now, um, not just with a, a, an idea of like, this is correct, but with an idea of like, not just, what the text probably meant in its own context, but how it's been used and reappropriated, et cetera, in different theoretical contexts over time, that's important. If you want to get an intellectual grasp of, of how some kind of political thought changed over time. And then you also need to figure out how different kinds of people read it, who came to it with a hermeneutic of suspicion, who came to it with a hermeneutic of faith, et cetera. So hopefully the reason why I'm covering these hermeneutic chapters, uh, you know, hermeneutic subjects, not chapters, um, is to get you guys to think about why I do the method that I do on this channel. All right. Very small channel. Um, I'm not quitting my day job anytime soon. Nonetheless, is something that you should consider. All right. Well, I hope you found this educational. I hope you check out the links in the show notes. If you want more, we have a Patreon where I answer questions. Or there's a Discord. We have reading groups. Um, there are additional shows. You get audio from every show on the on the YouTube, as opposed to just the free audio of the interviews about three weeks to a month later, which is which I provide for people who prefer the audio format for free. I have learned that a lot of people actually my age actually prefer the audio format because we don't get distracted by all the video and also we can do other things. Um, so I hope you enjoy that. Um, if you want, there are three, five and $10 levels. Um, but if you don't want, uh, leave liking and subscribing, sharing on Facebook, uh, all helps because this is an unmonetized YouTube channel and thus not prioritized in the algorithms. Not, dampened in the algorithm either as far as i can tell but it is not prioritized so um sharing this organically really does help spread the word uh thank you so much and i hope you have a great day hit the bell if you are so inclined and want more of this content mm -hmm.